I did sort of have some dabbling in uh, recreational drugs. And uh, I guess this is like the one thing I might share in common with Stephen Jobs, um, certainly isn't his financial success, um, is that we both feel that LSD was a very important sort of experience to have. Um, but in my case, I think it's a little different than in uh, Stephen's case. Um, in my case, the impact that it had on me, and this was after I had read Freud and I was really just completely fascinated by his, his uh, uh, theory, um, was how you could take a tiny amount of a pharmacologic substance, 50 micrograms or so, and it could so profoundly change your state of mind. And if this was the case, then by some slight error in an enzyme or a cofactor or the synthesis of a neurotransmitter, you could, you could change the way a person's mental state was very powerfully. So this sort of uh, uh, exemplified this kind of dichotomy, which really is the essence of psychiatry and mental illness, um, which is on one hand clearly reductionistic, or reducible to neurobiology, but at the same time also reflects the ephemeral and the existential. The thing I would say is, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better, because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. He comes by and he says, uh, hey Tripp, uh, you've never taken LSD, have you? <laughs> no. And I said, no. Straight out. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I thought so. And then he walks away. So of course, you know, he and I understood each other well enough that he knew that I knew that what he's basically doing is saying, I just came out of a meeting with somebody and they said that you disagree with me in this way about this thing. And I'm just thinking to myself that if you just dropped acid, you wouldn't be so damn screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> because he really absolutely believed uh, that LSD had been a very positive transformation in, in how he thought. PCR is another place where I was down there with the molecules when I discovered it. And I wasn't stoned on LSD, but my mind by then had learned how to get down there. I could sit on a DNA molecule and watch the polymerase go by, you know, and I didn't feel dumb about that. I felt like, I, I mean, that's just the way I think. It's like I put myself in all different kind of spots. And I've learned that partially, I would think, and this is again my opinion, through psychedelic drugs. Dr. Kerry Mullis, I now ask you to receive the Nobel Prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. Biogeneticist Dr. Carrie Mullis had won the Nobel Prize for inventing PCR, a revolutionary technique for multiplying tiny amounts of DNA for use in genetic research. A creative breakthrough he claims came from psychedelic drug use. I don't do experiments often, you know, in big things like, what well, if I had not taken LSD ever? Would I have still invented PCR? I don't know. I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. Recent months and uh, past couple of years, there have been uh, calls, both in the media, uh, as well as to some degree in the professional literature, for the uh, use of various psychedelic agents 
for psychotherapeutic purposes. And uh, specifically, this is referred to LSD, to um, psilocybin, uh, to um, a ayahuasca, uh, which is used in um, some South American uh, and uh, Central American uh, indigenous um, uh, um, populations, uh, religious rituals. Uh, and then also uh, an NMDA or ecstasy. Um, these have been proposed to be useful from various things ranging from PTSD to addiction to depression to various types of um, personality disorders. Uh, the problem is is that these calls are occurring in a environment um, where there's no framework uh, or context for how they should be studied and then on what basis they could be used in a safe fashion. Um, I think as most people know, uh, psychedelic drugs, when they were developed and began to be studied for medical purposes in the 1950s um, and then 60s got really ensnared uh, by the um, social and cultural uh, turmoil of the counterculture in the 60s and because of their widespread use for recreational purposes um, they uh, were basically banned or outlawed or made illegal and, and uh, became politically banned from medical research. Um, there was some promising uh, evidence for they're a useful application to treatment of mental disorders, but this really was never fully developed to a point where uh, these could be uh, determined, uh, reviewed by the FDA and determined whether they were safe and effective for you know, clinical practice. Um, and we've had a almost 50 year hiatus in any serious investigation, except for some heroic investigators and uh, a few universities, uh, more in, in Europe, but some in the United States as well. But for various reasons, there now seems to be increasing calls from people within the medical profession, mostly psychiatry, but also uh, outside uh, in the sort of uh, general public of informed observers or consumers of literature on this topic. Um, so my Point is not to say that um, these should be discounted and uh, you know, relegated to uh, the criticism and uh, dismissal of some you know, clearly unfounded you know, new age treatments or nutraceutical or naturopathic treatments for which there's real no basis uh, for claims for therapeutic efficacy, uh, but that these drugs which clearly are pharmacologically active, have profound effects, could be useful for therapeutic purposes, need to be studied in an intensive and extensive way before an informed determination can be made. Um, if not, we'll find ourselves in a situation that may resemble what we're seeing now with marijuana, with its increasing legalization, uh, even despite the fact that there's not an adequate knowledge base because of because of social pressure and political pressure. Um, so I personally feel that um, the scientific investigation of mind-altering psychedelic drugs uh, in the 1960s and 70s was tr truncated in a promising avenue of research, and these medications, these drugs, uh, could have significant value uh, for a variety of indications. Uh, if um, studied adequately. However, until we have that, it really is not prudent for any serious uh, calls uh, for proposals for these to be used on an ad hoc uh, experimental basis. Um, they need to be studied and uh, they need to be determined for what purposes they should be used and what are the risks and, and benefits for these treatments. So uh, I'm calling for more serious, prudent, thoughtful, and informed uh, opinions to be expressed on this topic before this catches on in the, the public and uh, the medical community does not 
uh, pay sufficient attention and respond to them accordingly, um, and then we need to react to a growing uh, body of opinion, which uh, calls for something which is not uh, necessarily ready for prime time. So thank you for listening. This is Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman of Columbia University.